Uh, it, it, most of it is based on a, a long chapter from a forthcoming book of, of mine, uh, tentatively titled Mind the Dialogue Within. And I might mention that the fundamental idea in it is a very old one, going back to the ancient Greeks, uh, but uh, the one that has co been completely lost sight of uh, since the Middle Ages or even earlier. And actually it uh, is based uh, on an idea for which there is, uh, one can make an English word, and it turns out that this is an English word that doesn't exist. Uh, uh, namely, self-conversation. Now, the prefix self, if you look at Webster's, the large Webster's of the OED, uh, is used in innumerable uh, ways. I counted more than 500 listed in the OED, and it says, like, self-accusation, self-approbation, self-esteem, you know, self-reproach, I mean, you, know, you can go on and on. You can add self to almost anything, except to conversation. Now, it turns out, I don't know how many people in the audience speak German, it so happens that in German there is a word for it called Selbstgespräch. It's already a German word. I see my Austrian uh, uh, visitor here. Uh, there is such a German word. Now, obviously, this is something which we do all of the time. But this has become, in the 20th century, psychiatrized. If you talk to yourself, you are crazy. It's called hallucination. <laughs> Well, this is very similar to masturbation, which is a universal kind of human act, which used to be called crazy for 300 years. It's called self-abuse. Now, I've sort of given you a way, given you a way of what's in the book uh, that's coming out, except there's a little more in it than this. <laughs> <laughs> but now, I, uh, this is sort of the background against which I want to talk about responsibility which is obviously a very, very fundamental kind of a human notion, uh, having to do not only with the health professions, but with everything virtually, except pure science, pure physical science. So let me pre begin to present some stuff, and then what I would like to do, and I deeply regret that uh, sort of everyone doesn't have a microphone, because what I would like to do is to really have a conversation with you. It's, I am not comfortable personally to stand up here and talk for three hours, I mean, 50 minutes is sort of my maximum. And I like to talk, as I indicated yesterday, sort of to one person at a time, and uh, it doesn't matter how many people are here, I'm so happy to see so many of you, but I could speak to one person and then the others could be the audience and vice versa. Now, maybe we can still do that. Those of you who are close enough, I think, could speak up without the microphone and I could repeat your question because it would be awkward for people to line up there in huge numbers. And some of you couldn't get there, and mechanically it would be difficult. But that's what I would like to do. Because also the subject doesn't really lend itself to a great deal of pontification. I mean, there is endless stuff one can talk about, obviously about responsibility. Now what I will do, to give it some structure, is to talk about some of the historical, conceptual background of it in the first half of the morning, and the second half I will talk mainly about two issues which pertain to mental health particularly, historically, and particularly acutely today, and that is uh, embodied in the commitment laws of every Western society. And that is, as you know, in every Western society, as far as I know from Russia and Hungary and Romania in the East to England and Portugal on the West to the United States, South America, there are laws which in effect say almost verbally, almost verbatim the same thing, and that is a person may be committed to a mental hospital if he or she is mentally ill and dangerous to himself or others. Now that phrase, dangerous to himself or others, is what we'll talk about in the second half, which in plain English means who is responsible if John Doe or Jane Doe kills someone else or kills himself. Now as you know, if such a person is now in therapy, then the therapist is responsible. Now this is, a, you know, the world has been around for a few thousand years. Nobody ever thought of this idea before. And nobody ever thought of this idea outside of the United States. Outside of the United States. If you tell somebody this in Italy, they laugh at you. So, uh, but that, uh, let's, I want to build up some background for this. Now, first of all, what is responsibility? I mean, it's an ordinary English word. But let me indicate to you that it has at least three quite distinct meanings, and I will 
we'll be talking about uh, only two or one and a half of these meanings. Now, in ordinary discourse, we use the word responsible to mean at least three quite different things. One, a physical cause. Two, moral blameworthiness. And three, legal culpability. And I can give you three very compact English uh, I mean, examples, very compact in the English language. We say that lightning was responsible for setting a forest on fire. We say that Jones was responsible for burning down his house because he fell asleep while smoking. Now, in which case, in the written version here, I add in parentheses, we say that Jones was responsible for unintentionally burning down his house because he fell asleep while smoking. What he wanted to do was smoke and sleep. He didn't want to burn down his house. I mean, you are all laughing now. <laughs> and we say that Smith was responsible for burning down his house because he wanted to collect the insurance on it. In which case, we insert the word intentionally in front of burning down his house. Now, but how do we know that these are the cases? What, how do we know that somebody has intentionality? Now, here it becomes very interesting. Because intentionality, having intention, is virtually synonymous with being responsible. We say that somebody is not responsible for something when he, does have, when he, does, he doesn't intend it. We don't say that somebody intentionally has diabetes. In fact, there is no way in which we give yourself diabetes or leukemia intentionally. But you can certainly give yourself, uh, what is it called uh, now, factitious disorder. You can certainly uh, 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 do something, uh, I mean, drink, drink blood and vomit it up in an emergency room and then say, you know, I, you know, I'm sick or something like that. In other words, malingering illness. But malingering, as you know, has gone out of fashion. It's now called the disease itself. So you see how the issue of intentionality becomes complicated. Now, there's good reason for this. And the best way to get at this is if through by starting with a newborn. Well, we assume that a newborn is not responsible for anything. Right? And that sort of seems common sense. I mean, here's a baby just delivered from the womb. Well, what is he or she responsible for? Well, it's ridiculous to assume that this being is responsible for anything. So when does responsibility begin? Because pretty soon there is an expectation that this baby shouldn't be feeding all the time. Or maybe shouldn't be urinating in his pants. Or maybe should be feeding himself. So well, how do you know which is which? Now, a number of people have addressed this subject. You know, this is a wheel that has been invented by many others, so I don't have to do too much inventing. And let me read to you three passages here from three quite different kinds of persons who have grappled with this thing and to have pointed out that responsibility is, now to put it in my terms, that responsibility is basically best thought of in this moral and legal sense as not a phenomenon that you find in nature. It is not like having blue eyes or dark hair. Now, I cannot emphasize this enough because it has become conventional practice and it's common sense now that when somebody does something, especially something which is considered to be somewhat bizarre, like killing his wife, what could be more normal, but you know, that's, uh, you know, it's not considered bizarre. That, 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 that person, or killing her husband, uh, <laughs> there's no, uh, nothing sexist about this. Uh, that, that person, if, as you read the daily papers, first thing you know is that, you know, John Dole was arrested for, for, I don't know what, or throwing gasoline in a, in a store at, where he was fired, and, uh, or shooting his boss. The police took him to a local mental hospital for an examination of his uh, psychiatric status. In other words, they're now going to find out whether or not he was responsible, whether or not he possesses responsibility, like whether or not he possesses kidney function. This is quite literal, a literalized metaphor now. So they're going to examine it now. 
as against this concept, I am suggesting to you, and there is lots of uh, opinion and evidence to bear this out, that responsibility is an attribution. It is like beauty or like value. How much is a Renoir worth or a, or a Rembrandt? Or is the fake? Is the real? I mean, you know. And so, you know, it looks the same, but if it's a fake, certainly it's not worth as much as the real one. So we attribute the value to it. We attribute even the beauty to it. And whether or not you like rock music or classical music, I mean, these are attributions. Now, what does that make it look like? Now, a philosopher, not a particularly well-known one, but one who has written about this, named Arnold Kaufman, wrote the following. Listen carefully, because these are quite meaty statements. One may be justified in blaming or praising an infant in order to influence his future behavior, but there would be no justice in doing so. This is full of meaning. We'll, I'll come back to all this. Now, the well-known uh, uh, conservative libertarian economist Friedrich Hayek said the following, emphasizing more the political aspect of this. Quotes. The statement, this is very relevant, uh, there was at least one person who, uh, walking over, told me he's working in a prison. This is going to be quite relevant to people who are working with involuntary patients or, you know, with the present state of mental health. Quotes, the statement that a person is responsible for what he does aims at making his actions different from what they would be if he did not believe it to be true. We assign responsibility to a man not in order to say that as he was, he might have acted differently, but in order to make him different. Now this Essentially, high exposition is like my position, that responsibility is a future-looking, a forward-looking concept. And to examine somebody for being responsible in the conventional way is utterly stupid. I mean, we'll, we'll see how stupid that is. <clears throat> now, finally, I want to quote something that C.S. Lewis uh, said, and of course, he put it most elegantly, but also most elliptically. But I think this is the best statement of them all. Quotes, Christ died for men precisely because men are not, his emphasis, not worth dying for. He died for them to make them worth. It. Now that's a typical Lewis twist, and I think that's beautiful. And now let's see where we go with that. Now, this is now I'm jumping to a different angle of looking at this. We are accustomed also to thinking that somehow we adults, especially if we have some education, have some, some sort of correct understanding of how the world works, especially how other people work and how responsibility works, you know. Uh, was Simpson guilty or not? Well, there is not a man or woman or child in this country who doesn't have an opinion on that. We all know whether he was or wasn't. Now, my point here not is whether or not we know, but that we have this feeling, and that this is quite instinctively obvious that we know. Now, this is actually true for every man, woman, and child from the earliest age on. As soon as children begin to have any intelligence at all, there seems to be no question that they understand everything about them in the world. There is never a time when people do not understand everything. Now, of course, they understand it incorrectly. <laughs> but that doesn't matter. That's not the issue here. After all, how many of the things which we understand are true? It's a very complicated world. By everything, I mean how the laws work, how every drug works, which is better, you know. You know, If you are 60 years old, is it better to have a PSA test on a routine exam or not? Is it better to have routine mammography when you are 35? I mean, you could, you could take any current issue where you have, you know, is it better to buy a stock now or to sell it? I mean, do you know that? In a sense, since knowledge has to do with the future too, obviously, this is all very complicated. 
But you have some idea about it. They are all convinced, you know. Listen to you know, stockbroker experts. They all know exactly that the market will go up and down. And this is how they make a living. If we newsletters now, they had a very wise father who told me, well, if these people knew what they are doing, they would be selling newsletters, they would be millionaires sitting on the Riviera. <laughs> <laughs> now, obviously, none of these people know what they are talking about. But, <laughs> but they have studied the thing and they have some informed guesses about it. Now, what I'm getting at is that you can observe the same thing, and of course, this is uh, sort of anthropology 101, that primitive people, so-called, what you know, modern Western people call primitive people, have their own understanding of the world, their philosophy of how the world works. And also, you go back historically, the Greeks, well, we know there is a terrible earthquake, or there are terrible rains that swallow up houses in California. Well, we know what did that. The wind god, the rain god, right? There's a drought, the sun god, the this, the that. Now, this is called animism. Nothing in the world happens unintentionally. There's no such thing as a natural death. Somebody cast an evil eye. No such thing as natural, it's disease. It's due to some malfeasance by a human being or a suprahuman being or an infrahuman being called gods and devils. So everything is caused, right? Totally caused of the news. This is essentially the, the Greek polytheistic view to some extent still, that although there was a strong sense already of developing morality there, some of the human beings were like puppets. They were assigned responsibility it's a rather interesting kind of a worldview, back to Homer and the early Greeks, really, pre-Socratic. Because although they, it, it really seems like they had no free will because they did whatever you know, the gods in heaven told them to do, but they were still human. Now this changes only very gradually. This idea that somehow God is a supreme mover, you know, I don't know what church father said, that a sparrow doesn't fall from the heavens without God having caused it, without it having a cause. In other words, it has this kind of a direct quasi-personal action based on the sense of a human action. Now from this I want to jump to the opposite worldview, which has developed only really from the late 19th century on, and which Hayek actually, the same Hayek, coined the term for which has become quite commonly used, uh, perhaps not in everyday parlance, called scientism. Now many people think that, uh, confuse science with scientism. Science is a very restricted kind of an activity, uh, having to do with very few tentative explanations. But scientism is the idea that we really have some sort of a causal explanation for everything, that virtually all the mental health Psychiatric research of the last hundred years is this kind. You know, we are going to do genetic research on schizophrenia. Well, we don't know what schizophrenia is, what the term means. But we are already doing genetic research on it. So what we are saying is we're going to find some sort of cause for something that we call schizophrenia. So we are already into this mindset of, of explaining something, meaning that we are going to give it some causal explanation which will take it out of the realm of responsibility. Because these two things are mutually exclusive. If something has an impersonal cause, then it is meaningless to talk about responsibility. In other words, if, uh, if a meteor falls out of the sky, and falls on a region and, 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 and kills people in a house, we don't talk about responsibility, except you know, somebody may talk about divine justice, that maybe these people are evil, you know, some religious people may talk that way. And then, you know, non-religious people think that's kind of stupid way to talk, because this was accidental, you know, no, no one caused this. All right, now, let me see where I want to go with this. All right, so the point of this scientific, scientistic effort is to get away from responsibility and somehow to demonstrate that 
nothing. There is no evil in the world that somehow everything has been caused by antecedent events. The best event, the best example of which is this general explanation of criminality and mental illness by the, uh, for example, by the title of Carl Menninger's famous book, The Crime of Punishment. The crime of punishment I like to cite because he's called crime a punishment, and this is based on the idea which was already not many years, which was already writ written about for, for some decades by then. This was in the 50s or 60s. Namely, that disease, that the crime is a disease. That is to say, it's not a moral act. Now, we don't speak about the morality of a lymphoma or of cancer of the prostate. So it's now out of the moral realm. Therefore, if crime is this kind of a thing, then that's out of the moral, moral realm. And in this way, everything is taken out of the moral realm. Crime, schizophrenia, is happening, and so on. Kleptomania, you can go, go through DSM. Now, what I want to get into here is to show the origin of this from the Bible. Then I would like to have some discussion, because I am... I know that I am jumping around, but this whole thing fits in together like a puzzle. Now let's look at the current situation and see how we deal with what on the face of it, if you are kind of an intelligent Martian and just come to Earth and see that actually adult human beings who seem to be quite normal, competent, they behave, and let's see how we treat their behavior. Today, we regularly punish people who tempt, but tend to excuse those who are tempted. The remark of a Colombian judge, apropos of the decriminalization of the use of cocaine in Colombia in 1994, is typical. I'm quoting from the New York Times now. This epitomizes this aspect of the issue. We are just saying, he explained, that the person who consumes a drug is a victim, the whole issue of victimology, and that the person who traffics in drugs is a criminal, end of quote. To this judge and to the American public whom he was addressing, it is self-evident that a drug seller, for whom we have all kinds of bad names, like dealer, trafficker, poisoner, is a responsible adult, whereas a drug user is like a non-responsible child called addict and, of course, patient. This perspective epitomizes the thoroughgoing rejection of the classic moral principle of caveat emptor, buyer beware, that pervades our present social scene. Now, actually, there is nothing terribly new about this, because already in the 19th century, in some ways, this began in the 18th and 19th century. I don't know exactly when. I have not made a study of this. But the model of this is, you know what? of punishing the tempter and not punishing the tempted, who engage in reciprocal acts. Now, this is easily guessable. Prostitution. Think of it. For hundreds of years, women were arrested, tortured, punished, persecuted for offering sex to men, who bought it and who went scot free. And this was nobody ever thought that there was anything wrong with this arrangement. Nobody in America thinks there's anything wrong with the present arrangement where drug sellers are considered to be bad people and drug buyers are considered to be good people. Wonderful people. They ought to have tax supported treatment for their disease called drug addiction. Which of course doesn't exist. Which simply means that they buy something that they want to enjoy. 300 million people. I don't know anyone who thinks, you know, obviously there are a few people who think, like I think, but very few. I mean, nobody talks like this about this, and everybody talks about how we have to do something about the drug sellers. Bomb them in Colombia. But why? All right, well, let's look. Let's look at this a little more closely. I don't like bifocals, that's why I'm fiddling with my glasses. <laughs> All right. I apologize to people who are uh, 
fundamentalistically religious, which I doubt there are too many in this room, because this is, because this is going to be a, 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 a quasi, you know, from my personal point of view, a kind of a religious, in quotes, reinterpretation of Genesis. Uh, I think you'll enjoy this. This is really, I think this is very good. Now, you know, the world begins when God creates the universe. And it's not very interesting at the beginning, although it moves very fast. I mean, first there is a void. Right? There's nothing. Then he creates the earth, and uh, still there's nothing. And then you know what he starts to do? He starts to talk to himself. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about? God is talking to himself. The first hallucinate. <laughs> let there be light. Well, why does he have to be let there be light? He can just make light. <laughs> Who is he talking to? There's nobody there. <laughs> now, to me, this indicates absolute identity, which is a very old idea also, of thought and action. Now, obviously, as we grow older, we interpose restraints in between this. But the little children talk about what they're going to do, often the third person, and, and of course also talk aloud. It takes quite a bit of doing to learn not to talk aloud. Talk to themselves. These are natural things, talking to yourself. If this is a psychiatric symptom, then we are in a bad way. Now, of course, nothing is a psychiatric symptom because there are no psychiatric diseases, but that's, that makes it simple. <laughs> well, let's, let's go through this thing as I see it. The drama begins then, I mean, the story really begins when they start to talk. Now, what do they talk about? The drama begins when Satan challenges Eve to eat the forbidden fruit. Now, Eve hesitates. This is the very beginning of the Bible, of the Old Testament. Eve hesitates, fearing God's punishment. Quotes, God has said, you shall not eat of it. Listen carefully, because every word is very important here. God has said, you shall not eat of it, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. Genesis 3, 3. Now, Satan, the next line, reassures her that God will, and it depends on how offensive or polite I want to be here, one could use all kinds of words here, I could say that God will welsh on his thread. One could also say that God is lying, is threatening, is pretending. The serpent said unto the woman, you shall not surely die. So next line, you shall not surely die. The rest, as they say, is history. <laughs> we could interpret, we could interpret this brief grand parable in the following several ways. This is now my <laughs> formulation. First, child abuse. The first historical case of child abuse. Lured to disobey their father's warning, two children yield to the seducer and suffer the consequences. The first case of advertising. Invited to enlarge the repertoire of desires, two consumers yield and their expectations are amply fulfilled. <laughs> <laughs> the first case of research. Persuaded to try a risky experiment, two investigators undertake it and improve their understanding of their environment. <laughs> they learn the difference between right and wrong. And finally, the first case of a verdict of insanity, of finding culprits not guilty by reason of insanity. Guilty of a capital crime, the judge fails to punish the criminals as required by his own law and sentences them instead to life imprisonment. I'm borrowing from Sartre. But it's just an interpretation of what is in here. Now, but let's look at this from still another angle. 
the view that man is a priori responsible for his actions is actually intrinsic to the Jewish and Christian religions and legends. These stories, make, if they are stories, if you read them as stories, make no sense unless human beings are responsible. God's incessant punishments of his own creations, especially of his own chosen people, the expulsion from the garden, the flood, the confusion of tongues, you know, it's nothing but one punishment after another. I mean, it's a brutal story. Make sense only if human beings are moral agents responsible for their actions. Punishment and forgiveness alike imply and presume personal responsibility. In proportion as we diminish or abolish these two concepts, which are symmetrical and the same, we transform our grand religious dramas of retribution and redemption from morality plays into incoherent acts of savage retribution and capricious clemency. They become kind of uh, senseless holocausts. Having made responsibility contingent on sanity, that is precisely the moral chaos we have created. We no longer regard responsibility as intrinsic to the human actor and his mind. Inst instead, we regard the human actor as intrinsically morally enfe enfeebled, enfeebled, a machine with a mind that belongs not to him, but to his brain. Now, I will stop here in one second. Uh, I don't know how interested you are, but even if you just read book reviews, you know, the last 20 years, 25 years or so, have been full of a gigantic literature of so-called neuroscience, a very small percentage of which may have some science in it, but virtually all of it is what I call neuromythology. Uh, Time Magazine, Newsweek, they all have these stories, how we have discovered the mind, and then stories about schizophrenia, and you open up the pages, and you have pictures of the brain. They're using the word mind and brain as though they were the same thing. Right? Now what does that mean? Then why do we have two medical specialties, psychiatry and neurology? What's the difference? Now all of this I will get to. Uh, I'd like to stop here uh, and give you a, a chance uh, to say something. Uh, I am. Uh, I think I've said enough to indicate that uh, responsibility is here a kind of a, a common sense, philosophical, practical, political, legal issue that cannot be delegated. Of course, it can be delegated to politicians or experts, but with the usual uh, risks inherent in that. But these are not... This is not uh, atomic science, or this is not uh, molecular biology, where we, you know, where the ordinary civilian can rightly say, "Well, I don't understand this." You know, I have to, in some ways, trust experts. This is not a matter of expertise. This is a matter of thinking clearly about this kind of issue that's already in the Old Testament and it's in the whole of philosophy. Uh, <clears throat> You must have something to say. <laughs> you go ahead, you are close enough to the microphone. This is also makes it easier for me than just to talk to you. To, I, to I agree with you about the um, equivalent responsibility for the drug pusher and the drug user, but I'm curious to know whether you think they should both be punished or neither. Well, of course, not, neither. People should only be punished if they injure somebody in their life, liberty, or property somebody else. I mean, this is back to Locke, and which is now called libertarian philosophy. If you do not harm anyone, why should you be punished? For what? For having pleasure? For giving somebody pleasure? For giving somebody pleasure in a way that you don't think he or she should have pleasure? I mean, what's wrong with selling high heroin? Any different from selling alcohol? Or selling lottery tickets? What's wrong with it? What's wrong with taking it? Nothing. Now you say you, you make yourself sick? Well, whose body is it? Don't you have a right to make yourself sick? Don't you have a right to kill yourself? We'll get to that. See, rights and responsibilities are two words for the same thing. I mean, there is this proverbial saying you're two sides of the same coin. They are more than two sides of the same coin. They are the same thing. You can deprive someone of liberty directly or indirect by, taking, by putting him in a prison or indirectly by taking away his responsibility. Ha, <laughs> that's much better. Then you can lock him up forever in a mental hospital or some equivalent. Put him on Prozac and something, you know. 
We'll, we'll talk about that. So it's the same thing. Somebody's at the right for now. I noticed that the Genesis story also talks about the first computer programmer, uh, Eve. She had an apple in one hand and a wang in the other. I'm sorry, I can't. I'm sorry, I can't add that to my <laughs> book, but, uh, <laughs> but it's not. It's not bad. I like it. Thank you. <laughs> yes, Dr. Sads. Um, I'm a theologian. I teach uh, in the School of Theology at uh, Emory University, Candler School of Theology. I also uh, do psychotherapy, which I call pastoral counseling, and. Uh, I have interest in uh, responsibility as well and find myself uh, kind of in a modern dilemma maybe, uh, uh, invested in the Judeo-Christian tradition, uh, but also uh, enlightened, maybe not so enlightened by uh, uh, modern psychology and uh, uh, psychic determinism, those sorts of things that make uh, uh, believing in responsibility uh, a struggle sometimes. Um, I, was in, I enjoyed your uh, interpretation of the creation myth, and I thought about the point where God starts talking to himself, and uh, I thought of a, kind of a, an editor's uh, conference and said, let's write a good story. Uh, what kind of characters do we need to write a good story? And said, well, we could have uh, uh, empty heads running around bumping into one another at random, uh, but that's kind of chaotic and doesn't have much meaning, doesn't have much drama. Let's attribute responsibility to these characters and write the story. And that makes the story much more interesting. Uh, and I can, I can see responsibility as an attribution uh, in one way of construing the world, in one way of construing reality. And if you're going to live in that story, that narrative plot where characters are responsible, then you have this interesting struggle of right and wrong, tragedy, drama, and so forth. Crime and punishment makes a great deal of sense. But we've got other uh, competing uh, narratives about who these characters are uh, in this drama. And when I think of the way uh, people were cared for out of uh, religion before, um, uh, I guess, a more liberal uh, perspective on or liberal anthropology was uh, constructed. Um, we tended to see people from an orthodox perspective as everyone being capable of being responsible. Everybody being capable of having uh, the capacity to make good use or right use of the freedom uh, that they have. There really wasn't a developmental perspective. Uh, there, w there was no way of really saying out of this tradition some people are more able, some people are less able because of developmental deficits or limitations or so forth. And everyone was treated the same. There was expectations. And if you fell short, you fell short not because you were diseased, but because you were weak. No? Go, go ahead. No, I want you to, to finish saying. Uh, OK. I mean, uh, yeah. you know, there is no way of seeing any of this. Let me just say this in, in your defense and my own. Yeah. There is no way of describing any of this without some kind of a prejudgment being built into the very picture, the language, which you are already doing. Because you are saying when everybody was dealt with the same. I, go ahead. Well, this is a long preamble. Somebody's urging me to yeah. ask my question behind me. Uh, <laughs> well, it's a good preamble so far. <laughs> so. <laughs> the, que the question I, I have is, um, uh, how, do, how do, do we need to speak of responsibility in degrees? Like, if I expect somebody I'm working with to be responsible, don't I have to sort of make a discernment as to what degree of responsibility they have what does it's freedom a very, very, very really important mean question. for them? And not make... Well, give a specific example. That's a very, very important issue. What do you have in mind? Of course, a schizophrenic or a drug addict. I mean, let's make this... I like to... Okay. You know, when I talk abstractly, I talk abstractly or, or, in, or in parables. But let's... Uh, when I talk about this kind of issue now, give me... And you say you do counseling. So what, what do you have in mind? Who, okay. is, this, well, who, is, right. this, who is this other person? I got a few examples you, because of Because you see, you're already building into this idea that he somehow is less responsible than you are. Well, I, I that you, you already convinced the whole audience of this. Uh, you haven't convinced me. I, I didn't follow that last <laughs> part. Uh, 
See, there is already an inequality where you, somehow you're going to be nice to him because he's not as responsible as you are. Well, I'm responsible for what I say, but not for how you interpret it, I don't think. No, uh, no, in I life. I mean, but so, I know, I let you finish it. I mean, who who okay. is this person? Well, I, one person that comes to mind, um, right. a woman that we might, uh, if we were into diagnosis, might diagnose her as um, multiple personality or borderline personality. Be careful, because you're going to make uh, mincemeat out of you. Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> well, I said, I said if we were into diagnosis. <laughs> Oh, but no, but the example, the example you all picked right. is, is I, I have to restrain myself. <laughs> sure, all right. All right, let's, let's skip that. All right, no, uh, no, let's stick right. to that. It's too uh, good. Hold it right uh, there. Hold it right all there. All right, a woman, woman Hold it. No, no, let's hold it. It's too good. It's okay. Too good. You I, say she has a diagnosis of multiple personality. I say she is an evil liar who does not take responsibility for herself, but instead makes up this story like a five-year-old, that I didn't do it, Johnny did it. The non-existent brother. Every five-year-old said that as soon as he's caught. Well, this is, this is what we have to unlearn. This is a highly complex theatrical performance, which people she, do. She also thinks she is an evil liar, and I'm trying to convince her she's not. Well, I am <laughs> joking. I am not suggesting roasting her in, you know, uh, in hell forever. She's not an evil liar, obviously. She is somebody in trouble, like a child caught by powerful parents, and is trying to get out of this trouble. She was uh, given but a way to be raised by I her I don't doubt parents. that she is, a, this is a troubled person. Okay, very, very ill. Uh, yeah. She uh, is a troubled person, but as soon as you do not give her as much responsibility for making those stupid statements, making that particular imagery, which is no different than the imagery you're going to suggest to her, whether it's a diagnosis or take responsibility or, you know, what's bothering you, whatever you're going to say, to my mind, has the same weight of responsibility or vice versa, that whatever she is saying. That I, I agree with This you. is a dialogue between two equals, and as soon as you treat her less equally, I disagree with you, no, but let me go back to an earlier statement of, of yours to show you how there are two ways of looking at this picture, because in some ways you were uh, harking back to some 13th century uh, Christian situation, right, where people were taken care of. Well, there are two beautiful words. People were not treated as though they were all equally responsible. Troubled people, and let's use that, that, that version, especially if they're poor, destitute. Maybe they gambled away their money. Maybe they, they did something wrong. Maybe they, they committed some crimes. Maybe in some ways, for their own fault or for their parents' or bad upbringing, whatever, they were in trouble. But there were two things which were extended to them. Charity and another thing. Mercy. I have no objection to courts being merciful. I have great objection to finding people psychiatrically unfit to stand trial or or, 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 or you know, or sending some man or woman to a mental hospital for three weeks after burning down the man in while she's sleeping in a bed or cutting off his penis like this lady in uh, North Carolina or South Carolina who spent three or four weeks in a mental hospital. See, that is, that is the evil of the society and of the profession, in my opinion, and of the legal profession, which are like, like Siamese twins. There's no distinction. The law and the mental health profession are like Siamese twins in, in this whole thing. They, can, they can't be separated. They, they, they do this together. So uh, what you bring up is a very important point. Perhaps we can talk about that more. This attempt to quantify responsibility. Now this comes up with, you know, are schizophrenics responsible for you know, pushing somebody under a subway and so on, you know. Well, this is every day. You can't open the papers anymore without seeing these stories. And nobody is held responsible. That's why there are many more people now that in a mental, there have always been, there are many more people under mental health coercion control than under criminal control. I mean, we, uh, we act as though that wasn't the case. I mean, this is the major system of social controls that we have. Thank you. On the premise, thank you. Based on the premise that somehow these people are less responsible and therefore the only people who are considered to be fully responsible are in prison. And even there, by the way, they are no longer considered responsible because they are given psychiatric drugs now. So this is a very far-reaching issue. Go ahead, please. I think I'm too short for the... Um, uh, oh, thanks. 
Um, thank you for saying that the mind is uh, not the brain. Uh, I come to this field from um, something else before. I used to like this philosopher who wrote extensively on the morality of thinking. And he said that we are not enough subjects yet, that we are not subjects. That the problem is that we are in a culture that identifies goodness with being objective and identifies silliness with being too subjective. The problem is that we are not subject enough. Uh, Adorno. Theodore Adorno. Yes. Theodore Adorno. Yeah. Um, at any rate, one thing that um, he wrote about also was that there was, though, a problem with looking at responsibility. He didn't use your term attribution, but in my understanding was very similar. He picked an argument with the Greeks who had this concept of kalos kaiagathos, good, therefore, beautiful, and beautiful, therefore, good. The problem which seems to me, how are we going to help our society make us more subjects. I now work with rape victims and of course a rapist is to me a person that under no circumstances is acceptable to regard as himself a victim of PTSD because he was in Vietnam and when he came back he started to rape women. And yet even giving, you are asking rightly for concrete examples, this would be mine, uh, Still, even if I think of a rapist, my question is, why is he not responsible, which is one of my understanding of our responsibility? What is our responsibility as members of a society and the world so that we don't help all of us? In I, I'm sorry, I don't understand the, what, the question or what, what you're saying about rapists. What is our responsibility as members of a society so that we come short of helping every subject being responsible. What is this factor? Uh, I still, I, I, I understand, but I don't understand it because you are now using the word responsibility in this, in, in this modern, uh, uh, very subjective way. Maybe I shouldn't have agreed with you so quickly. When, when somebody says, what is our responsibility towards rape victims or towards society? No, towards I, the rapists, I, towards people who do wrong, towards people that... What is our responsibility evil. towards them? Yes. Before, before they become evil. <clears throat> well, I can answer that question in two ways. First, I can't answer it. <laughs> uh, because it's too abstract. We only have our primary responsibility is towards ourselves to act in such a way that we are good persons, in the religious sense, good persons. That we fulfill our obligations towards ourselves and those who depend on us. That we don't cheat, we don't lie, uh, we earn our living, we take care of ourselves, and so that we are good persons. Now, when we talk about responsibility to other people in the abstract, uh, that uh, I give up there because I, I believe in this respect, in the sort of Adam Smithian invisible hand. If we are all good persons, then we'll have a good community. And we do not have some kind of an abstract responsibility to people we don't even know. I mean, that, that's, a, that's a language I can't, I can't follow. So, so what our responsibility is to a person who is a rapist before he commits a crime, I, I can't answer that. Now, I know what our responsibility is to a person who is a rapist after he commits a crime. And my answer would be the same as to that, to somebody who shoots somebody, who kills somebody. Again, without uh, trying to provoke you or risk your disapproval, I don't particularly like the idea of separating rape or any other crime. Crime is a crime, and people who commit crimes, if they are guilty, should be punished. A, a regularly, predictably lawful society is the precondition of civilization and human well-being. Well you know, to the extent to which you disturb that system, this is as old as the hills, you make it more difficult for people to live. And to single out particular crimes, whether it is sex crimes, rape crimes, or drug crimes, or crimes against the nation, or crimes against the economy, like in Russia, you know, what was a great crime there? Owning gold, or making private profit. I mean, this idea of singling out something particularly rape and drugs, is a great risk. Because these things, it is in a, in a way, I mean, again, I don't mean to shock you or to uh, invite your disapproval, 
But I am not sure the trip is any worse than having, being assaulted and being blinded, having both of our eyes put out by the robber. I don't know if you took some sort of poll of women, after women can involve women, what, what they would prefer. I mean, rape is a terrible thing. I, you know, don't accuse me of minimizing it. But there are even worse things. And we don't have, you know, ocu ocular crimes. Or being, be, or, being, or being people shot in the spine so they are quadriplegic. Is that any better? Why don't we have special crisis centers for you, for people who have caused quadriplegia? This category of rapists is to me offensive. There are, there are no rapists. There are people who commit awful assaults. And they should be in prison for 50 years, period. No th and no therapy in prison. Because the therapy implies they're going to get parole earlier. Now, they can have all the therapies they want, like all the religion, provided it has no bearing on their criminal status. If that's built into the system, then they can have all the therapy, like they should read Dostoevsky, or read Freud, or read whatever they want. <laughs> Crime and punishment. But you see, this therapy is built into this system in, in, in this way. We're going to be nice to them. Now, if you want to be merciful to somebody, then be merciful. You want to forgive somebody for raping somebody? Be my guest. I don't want to live there, but you can do that. <laughs> this is a classic. Look, you don't have to invent the wheel. It was, uh, who's, who, it was it's Victor Hugo. About that classic story about the starving man who st steals a loaf of bread. Who is, who is that? Let me say Thank you. I, 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 did, I didn't want to misquote it. I thought it was Victor Hugo. Okay. Well, I think that's used very often in, et in text of ethics or what. Not or if it's not, I am making it up. Uh, but what is the correct punishment? Supposing this man comes, is arrested, after all, he's stolen something, and you are the judge. Now, it seems, I don't know what you would say. I'll, I'll tell you what I would say, and I think most of you will agree. The punishment is to sentence him to whatever would be the minimum term for stealing, whatever it is, $2 worth of property, let's say two weeks in jail, suspended. Mercy. After all, he has injured the baker. If enough people steal enough bread, then the baker will be, <laughs> won't have any bread. And then his children will be starving. So this business of being generous with other people's money, you know, the Jimmy Carter syndrome, you know, be nice, you know, running all over the world, giving every our money. I mean, that's, <laughs> It's very nice. I call it Jimmy Carter syndrome. But you know, it's, it's, a lot of politicians like to do that. Go ahead. Yes, sir. Thank you. I um, personally work a lot in the um, judicial system in Florida. And what I have seen recently, and I, this is my own personal opinion, I think the law really lacks morality sometimes. And I think what I see in trials sometimes, and I work a lot in substance abuse in the substance abuse field, is I see attorneys using DSM criteria an addiction as an excuse to let people off jail. And I personally think that, I mean, if there is a diabetic, I, I think there is a first fallacy that if you suffer from a disease, you are not responsible. And I think any disease you suffer from, you are definitely responsible for the consequences as far as your moral um, stand is concerned and legal stand as well. I mean, if you are a diabetic and you don't take your insulin, and you get into a diabetic coma and you kill somebody, you're definitely responsible. And the same, and the same goes for uh, addiction. If you are, happen to have a disease of addiction and you uh, went out and used drugs and you kill somebody, well, you kill somebody. You, you, should, you should be put away. But I think attorneys, what I see anyway, and this is my only personal opinion, is that attorneys use this as an excuse to win a case and to let this guy off the jail, and I think we really need in this country, uh, laws, laws, attorneys need to be moral. We need to have some morality in the judicial system. <laughs> Up until I... <laughs> oh, okay. Up, and, uh, up until I raised my hand, I thought I, well, everything you said was magnificent. I completely agree. But your last point, uh, I would like to discuss. I completely agree with what you said. And, and then I thank you very much, and I hope you are listening and paying close attention, because again you see the hypocrisy built into our society and into the medical system itself. People with real diseases, with diabetes, with leukemia, with brain tumors, are not held not responsible for their behaviors. You can have a brain tumor the size of a golf ball in your head, and no neurologist will testify 
that you embezzle, that you killed your wife because of a neurological disease. You read all this literature from NAMI and whatnot, how schizophrenia is like Parkinsonism or like amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, where if you commit a crime with amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, nobody would dream that multiple sclerosis or amyotrophic lateral sclerosis caused you to be a criminal, which is what you are saying. So this is a particular construction. Now, when at the very end you say that lawyers should be more moral, that's taking it out of context, because lawyers, this society, after all, is like a chessboard with a lot of people, and every piece has its own particular role. Now, you can't expect people to be completely acting out of their own role. A lawyer's job is to defend his or her client in the way in which they can, as it was endlessly emphasized in the Simpson trial. And it is, a, it is a job of the rest of society to block that, not to appeal to their better judgment about to be superhumanly good. It should be, you should, society should make crime not pay. Not pay criminals to make, to acquit people. In which, by the way, when you say that the, the lawyers can't do this alone, because although this is the way you believe, for every, peop, every mental health professional like you, I can produce 10,000 who would be happy to testify for every one of those cases, for thousands of dollars, that yes, the person was not responsible. Because, as I mentioned yesterday, the money is a seduction which is hard to resist, especially if you need it. <laughs> so, so everybody, in a sense, everybody has his or her price. The only question is what it is. Now, there are exceptions. I'm, I'm not saying Obviously, there are exceptions. You know, this is all, all discussion between you know prostitution and you know what is it? You know, I, will I, you do? Will you have sex with me for if I give it to, uh, for a million pounds? If I give it to charity? You know that story about Miss Bernard Shaw. I'm sorry, I'm not saying that it's the fault of the uh, judicial system or the attorneys that we have these problems. What I'm saying is that we really have to define uh, what we believe in as mental health professionals. And, you know, we all have, as citizens, a, a certain moral responsibility to our fellow men. And uh, what I see sometimes is that we don't really take that into consideration. We live in a very uh, kind of uh, objective um, I, 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 let, 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 me, let, me, let me finish. And I think there is also, excuse me, and I think there is also a real stigma against people that suffer from addiction because... Well, of course somebody, it is stigma. Well, excuse me, but you see, if somebody dies from, uh, from uh, diabetes, I mean, people feel sorry because, hey, the, the person had a, a problem with diabetes and, you know, he had a, a heart attack and he died. But we see somebody that dies from an addiction problem and we don't really feel very sorry for them because we think... Now, hold it, right, hold it right there and let's give somebody else. You are very good. Thank you very much. We could, we could uh, maybe later on, I, don't, I mean, we, I could talk to you for the rest of the morning. Okay. <laughs> but you see, again, I, I, in part, very largely, I empathize and agree with you, but I don't quite agree with every nuance because, first of all, you talk addiction as though it was an entity and as though there was some similarity to the diabetes. It's a disease. It's an illness. Well, you know, you know that a now are we going to we are not going to spend this morning discussing what's a disease, but you see that the word disease is being used as a way of annulling responsibility. But it shouldn't That's be why that. I want to talk about responsibility, morning. But if by disease you mean that the person is not responsible for having it. What I'm saying is that if what are you saying? What I'm saying is what I'm saying is that if you are if if I am a diabetic and I suffer from that disease, I am responsible to take my insulin so I don't go into a diabetic coma. And if, excuse, and if I suffer no. from an addiction disease, I am responsible not to use drugs and to go to meetings or to go to therapy or do whatever it is that I need to do not to use. No, no. Well, let me explain to you how where you are wrong because this is very easy to do with addiction. Look. What you are saying, to put it in different words, is that a person with a real disease, like diabetes, or let's say lupus, leukemia, that a person is not responsible for having diabetes, but is responsible for managing his or her life as a diabetic. Absolutely. Okay. Yes, sir. That's what you're saying. Now, let's take addiction and let's take the classic example of it. Let's take the most addictive drug to which the most Americans have been addicted, smoking. Let's assume that you are a nicotine addict. You cannot do with diabetes what you can do with nicotine addiction. Namely, decide that I am going to quit. 
And then either do one of two things. Do what my father did after he had a heart attack, and that is to stop the next day, not smoke anymore. Or you can do what many, what 30 million Americans have done, do any number of things, like smoke 30 cigarettes one day, 29 the next, 28 the next, or go to a hypnotist, or go to an acupuncturist, or, go, or do something that will get rid of their smoking. Now, there is nothing like this you can do with diabetes, which isn't actually quite true, because if you have diabetes, which is not insulin dependent, which is due to some predilection, and you can lose 30 pounds or 40 pounds, and eat a little differently, you can get also rid of using insulin. So even there, you can control it. So responsibility is really anterior to even the concept of disease. But it is important that we not fall into the trap, and I really don't want to do that this morning because that would distract us, that we use the word disease simply to annul responsibility. Because that gets in the way. Disease is simply something which you have got, whether you are short or tall. I, there was no point in my training to be a heavyweight boxer. There's no, no point in Mike Tyson trying to be a jockey. <laughs> now, this is, you don't have to have diseases. I mean, there are certain things which make you, which are a handicap for some things and good things for other things. And so there's nothing special about diseases. Disease, everybody has some kind of disease. Who is healthy? <laughs> I mean, what do you mean that disease, something wrong with your body? I mean, everybody has something wrong with their body, more or less. So let's let give someone else a chance. Thank but you. you. Thank, thank you. you. <laughs> Go ahead. Hello. Um, when you were talking about uh, sending people who use drugs to drug addiction programs, I think that you were making a distinction between um, let them you know, ha get whatever pleasure that they get from their activities so long as they do not hurt someone else, and only to, to punish them if they, they do hurt someone else. Um, and to me, that sounds like a very appealing, um, very, what? very appealing way of, of thinking. My only question is, um, what if you can predict um, with a reasonable degree of certainty that, that this individual who is using crack cocaine or, or whatever is much more likely than average to do something that will violate other citizens' rights? Um, at but, what point can society decide to proactively protect itself good, very, rather than yeah. say, okay, let them do the antisocial act, let them um, yeah, leave you made someone the point. quadriplegic okay. and then punish them. That, that you know, it's justice, but it doesn't help the person who what has is, been what injured. Is, what is your own answer to that question? I think, I, I don't think that there is a good answer, but I'm there more is a, comfortable. There is a good answer. <laughs> I, I'm more comfortable with, you know, um, acting acting on the the good of the many and 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 violating perhaps that you know one in in a hundred um, crack users right who wouldn't do anything that would harm that's you know, very, anyone else. That's a very honest answer. I don't like it, but it's a very honest answer. <laughs> And I tell, I tell you why I don't like it. This, this question and the answers to it are again as old as the hills and especially as old as American and, and uh, Anglo-American uh, moral philosophy and, and law. Uh, actually, you know very well that there is one group of human beings in the United States about which this prediction can be made more accurately than any other. Mm -hmm. Which group is it? They are not addicts. Males? Males, male, males of what age and what color? Have young black males. Even black leaders recognize this. I mean, this is, this is not a racist comment. Now, does this justify in some way treating one of these individuals who may be completely innocent differently than you and me? See, you are, you are saying you want to throw out the old principle it's better to, wait, to let a thousand guilty people go free than to convict one innocent. Well, it's very dangerous because once you start convicting one innocent, you're going to go convict millions of innocents. So everybody is going to be, everybody who's going to be convicted will be innocent. Essentially, like in Russia or Nazi Germany. I mean, we have tried this. It's not going to be one. The one is just going to be the first one. Because <laughs> it's much easier to convict innocent people <laughs> than to convict guilty ones. <laughs> In fact, that's the old idea, that if, if deterrence is a principle which we accept, then why not punish innocent people just for the sake of deterring other people? 
These are very old questions. You gave a very honest answer. It is a popular answer in some ways of preventing uh, addiction because these people, when they take drugs, will commit crimes. Yeah. Now, this whole ideology, and I've written two books on this, is complete a complete pack of lies because people don't commit crimes because of drugs. They commit crimes because of drug prohibition. <laughs> well, uh, they commit crime. The cause of crime, drugs don't cause crimes, drug laws cause crimes. Yeah, I'm not saying that drugs cause crimes. I'm not making well, a what is Well, what then the, what business does society have I'm in prohibiting? I'm saying that people who use drugs are more likely to commit crimes. No, that's because they cannot get drugs legally in America. I mean, this is a very different subject you are raising now. Uh, you can't use drugs in America because every drug that's interesting is illegal in America. No. I mean, come on, where have you been? M much of it is, is, you know, killing people for the money to, to, to buy the drugs. But I guess that's not, that's more an example. I guess what I'm saying is... No, no, is but let's stick to it because you see you are picking an example, ignoring the legal structure, ignoring the responsibility of the American population for voting for politicians who bring in these laws. You are responsible if you don't protest against this. If you talk well, about what I'll be responsible for abstractly. Uh-huh. Instead, you treat, you know, many of you treat drug addicts. That's it. I think the, the drug laws the are problem. part of it. I don't think that it's only the drug laws which cause, which, for which reason, you know, drug users commit crimes. I don't think that if you took all the drug laws away, that people who were addicted to crack cocaine would suddenly be as unlikely to commit crime as regular non-addicted. There's no citizens. evidence for that, but because you see what you are, what you are implying is that there are two categories of people. People who commit crimes without drugs and people who commit crimes because they take drugs. Well, there's no evidence for this. People, most people who have committed crimes have been, in fact, the most famous person who has committed a crime in this century has been the most f violent anti-drug person in the 20th century. He was even a vegetarian, Adolf Hitler. He was, he was born against drugs than Nancy Reagan. <laughs> uh, okay. And he was very good to his dog. I mean, you know, this business of being against drugs, you can still be a pretty bad person. You can, you know, you can be against drugs, but you will not be very nice to people. I mean, <laughs> right. But the, but the broader point. So, uh, this got nothing to do with anything. And the founder of the Johns Hopkins Medical School was a morphine addict. Not to mention Sigmund Freud. Was he likely to commit crimes? He was a cocaine addict. I mean, where have we been? When I, when I went to, when I went to well, the Chicago Institute for Psychoanalysis, the only psychopathology that any could, could point to was one. I didn't smoke. I was the only one, literally. It's the 1940s. There was nobody around who did not smoke. I was the only person there. Well, what some people in the audience have been saying is, even if you legalize the drugs, people may still commit crimes well, of course, just to get the money, crime. to get the money to, to buy the drugs. Uh, well, why should they get money for, for any more than for green peppers or lettuce or aspirin? I mean, I don't understand your point. Of course, people steal because they want money. <laughs> Let, let's let's get, give okay, someone else a chance. The, 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 the broader point is you about are, utilitarianism, you, really. You humanitarian? Know, saying, no. What? No, I, I, you, you keep talking about drugs, but I'm trying to say that if drugs were as legal as green peppers, then, it would, then this dialogue wouldn't make any sense. <laughs> this alcohol, cigarettes, yeah. No, but you see, they are taxed too much. I prefer green peppers. <laughs> I'd, like, I'd like to uh, get back to mercy, uh, if we could, uh, for a minute. Um, I, I get the idea that the people who stand to be blamed, um, often in the case of schizophrenia, uh, first degree relatives, parents, um, are the ones who are most likely to be searching for a biological answer um, and looking at kind of a biological randomness as an explanation for their child's difficulties. And I think that <clears throat> with more understanding about uh, the effects of child neglect and abuse on later behavior, it becomes difficult to think about a simple blameworthiness um, without fearing a lack of mercy. And so I, I think that, uh, that uh, the, the, the whole biological movement in psychiatry is to bring mercy back into the system because we can't count on it coming from any other direction. 
you have any uh, comment on that? Yeah, I don't agree. <laughs> uh, I don't agree. I, again, um, uh, to risk of slightly overstating it and making it humorous, I think the whole thrust of modern biological psychiatry is to demoralize society and make more money for the mental health professionals. Agreed. Yeah, I, I'm not disagreeing with that. Well, I don't see bringing back, I don't see any tendency to bring back mercy because mercy is such an unmodern, such a religious concept. See, we, we rather talk about excuses and victimology. The whole, the whole ideology and rhetoric is, is towards victimology. Somehow if you can prove that your parents were back to you, you were abused, the Menendez thing, or you were brought up as a, in a poor black neighborhood in Haile, you know, all, all the lists of that, that excuse things, that, 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 that is not the direction of mercy. Mercy implies that you do not compromise with the idea that the person is as responsible, is 100%, that responsibility somehow is like pregnancy. You can't be a little bit responsible. And I'd like to talk a little bit more about that because actually we hold little children fully responsible for certain things. Like we hold a small child, at some point we hold a child responsible for not urinating in the middle of the living room. Or for eating or feeding himself, or for, or for not getting up at two o'clock and asking for food unless he, she's sick. And this is a hundred percent kind of thing. And this, uh, and in this way, we have someone asked about how we uh, measure, how we measure this. Now, we don't hold each other responsible, and we don't hold adults responsible either for things they can do. We don't hold elderly people responsible for running as fast as a young person and so on. This is a functional kind of common sense determination, which is a part and parcel of everyday ordinary discourse outside of any professional expertise. And that is when we talk with two suicide, I'll talk about this. This then becomes a matter for ordinary jury trials unencumbered by experts or even by lawyers necessarily. But I'll, I'll, come, I'll come back to that. Thank you. Uh, go ahead. Let's have a few more questions and maybe we can take a break. Yeah. What I'm concerned about is, you know, I, I truly believe that people are responsible individually for what they do. Um, regardless, but, regardless of schizophrenia? Regardless of schizophrenia. Good. But I my just concern to get... is, okay. it's related to the effects on society and what society's rules are, you know, for a couple examples. One, you know, in the, in the gentleman's comments earlier about um, cocaine. You have a pregnant, we say, okay, you can use drugs, whatever. Woman has a baby, crack, crack baby. Now society has a problem that we clearly as a society need to deal with because the child can't function normally. The mother is, you know, already gave birth to this child. So what the problem is. Or in another example. Well, hold it right there. Okay. I wish you didn't bring that up because uh, <laughs> uh, that, that really is another subject. Mm. Women are extremely powerful in numerous ways, m much more so than men. One of them along the line of procreation. Mm -hmm. now, women can also bring into being a baby with a T. Sachs disease, with all kinds of hereditary diseases. They but can again, also bring into being, they can also bring into being a baby every 10 or 11 months that they cannot support. Mm -hmm. So they have enormous possibilities for in this way making it complicated for the rest of the population. Right. I do not want to get that into this morning. I can't deal with that. That that is that really is an, uh, another subject. I don't know what you want to ask about that. That is this there for a reason for you and I not to be able to take cocaine? I'm not pregnant. <laughs> Why should you, for this reason, prohibit cocaine for everybody? No, and I would. See, there are lots of things that a pregnant women shouldn't take. I mean, this is an interesting medical question. There's no reason why other people shouldn't take it. Right. In and I, including and I this famous drug, which is very good for all kinds of diseases. Somebody help me. It causes which, uh, thalidomide, thank you. Thalidomide. Now, thalidomide apparently is an excellent drug for all kinds of diseases. But we can't have it because pregnant women shouldn't take it. Well, this, these are prudential, practical, medical, political, legal questions which, which don't belong to this discussion. Okay. The other okay. one would relate to, and it, I see it as somewhat similar, but, you know, like Clinton just said that, you know, people should be able to drive or ride their motorcycles without helmets. Well, it actually is a very practical consequence on society because now we have um, the federal government wants to take control of medical costs and all that. Well, but it affects see, society because of it costs that's, money. That's better. Okay. Well, stop right there because you already asked, said enough for two, <laughs> two weeks' worth of discussion. <laughs> 
see, society is in many ways like the proverbial sweater that somehow knitted in such a way that if you cut it in one part, the whole thing will untangle. Uh, of course, to the extent to which, and I alluded this, I take it, there are many of you here who did not hear me yesterday or maybe have not read all of my 23 books. But, <laughs> but, <laughs> but naturally, naturally, look, once you have created this socialistic, irresponsible system of medical care, mm -hmm. where, where, as I like to put it, we are responsible for everybody else, but not for ourselves. Right. Once you have created a system where we are responsible, where I am responsible for your health, naturally, I have an in enormous incentive to control your behavior. So maybe we should be less enthusiastic about this system that the government, we should take your money, give it to the government, and they'll give us health care. Maybe we should buy health care like we buy chips out here well, to I play agree. roulette. I agree. Maybe I that would be that. better to go. But that's a capitalist system. That has a bad name now. You want poor people not to have the same care as Bill Gates? Yes. <laughs> poor people don't get to say anything as Bill Gates. <laughs> but we have this myth of equality. The people get, the poor people get the same thing. Poor people will never get the same thing as rich people. Just like stupid people will never get the same thing as, rich, as intelligent people. Or ugly people as beautiful people. I mean, this is the way God made it. And it doesn't matter what you do in society, you can't change that. You can, you can make it even worse. So that, that point, again, is simply a footnote to the fact that, of course, then we have an incentive in that. I will talk more. I can't do anything. I, mean, I can only point that out. And there is no cure for that except to make it less so or to opt out of the system. Now, as that system becomes bad enough, you see, as the health, as I see it, as the health system will be bad enough, it will be like the schools in the inner cities. It is my understanding now that 40% of black children in Detroit go to parochial schools. Now, that is your answer. Not one of Jesse Jackson's children, as far as I know, went to a public school. See, actions speak louder than words. And there's nothing to do with color. Black people want to see anything as white people. Jews want to see anything as Christians. Want to have a decent life. <laughs> but you, the government can't give that to you. The government can only provide a framework in which more or less this is possible. Now, it can also make a framework in which this is relatively more difficult. But to the extent to which it becomes completely bad, people will opt out of it as best they can. And there is a large literature on it, which is again another system, there is a voucher system and so on. In other words, should we have a public educational system like the Russian way of producing steel? Well, the American people seem to have not really thought this through. Or why is this so good that the federal government should govern education? What's so good about this? And we have this mythology of states' rights and local rights. You know, it's all, it's all, this is a very complicated society. Go ahead. I'm very touched by what you're talking about personally. Because as a small child, I thought all along, when will I be responsible? When will I be me? Because that was very much connected with being responsible. That's, I what, was, I, that's what I always thought as a small child. Well, that's what I wanted to ask you. <laughs> that's what I, I was. Well, I wanted to ask <laughs> you to speak a little bit about your, your own process in emerging as a person who is so very passionate. So very passionate. Well, I don't like to talk about myself, especially Too not bad. in front That's of That's what I'm, I'm asking. You can say no. <laughs> but I am. This is, this is what's important I, because I don't I, believe that it makes a whit of difference when we talk about the society. I'm a theater person, yeah. Uh, it, it's about each of us. It's about what is this process? And I was 30 years a teacher, and I started my own school because I knew about responsibility, that, that there that, that was something, there was a, a gem about self in this that. This is so beautiful. Thank you so much. And, and I struggle, and I struggled. I wanted to know, what day was it that I became responsible? What day was it that those, all of you sitting around said, Donna, you're responsible today? And I never knew that. And now I'm a crone, an old, wise woman. And so I guess I'm responsible. So I'm real pleased about that. I want to know about your process. I want to know in 25 words or less or something, <laughs> how, did you, how did you get there so that well, you, those of us who want to support other people, not tell them, but to support them in their work, can do 
that sort of thing. And you may say no, but hey, I can only ask. Thanks. Th thank you very much. That's going to be hard to top. <laughs> th thank you very much. I already said something you, more than I usually say about myself, but I must say I had the same feeling as a small child. Now, how I got here, I can tell, I won't say no, I can uh, tell you, uh, which is uh, even more true, I, obviously I don't know how I got here. This is not the kind of question that uh, one usually asks oneself, and now even now that you also ask myself questions, even now that you posed it, uh, I would be tempted to dismiss it by saying I got here by working on it, like anything else. I mean, how do you get anywhere? But it also seems to me that this is, and obviously there are individual variations, maybe there are, no doubt there are parental uh, situational circumstances, that some people seem to have a greater drive for this than others. But uh, let's have a break, but before a break, let me tell you the story which uh, gripped me as a small child. I read, this is one of the books, few books, relatively few books. I was almost 19 when I came to America, and there are quite a few American books which I read in Hungary, in Hungary, in Hungarian translation. Uh, Mark Twain was a very popular author in Hungary, and so was Upton Sinclair. These are two authors that stand out, A.G. Wells, many others. Uh, but Mark Twain, Tom Sawyer, I read in Hungarian when I was quite young. Then I reread it again and again uh, when I was growing up in English. And there is one story in there which uh, uh, really got imprinted. And that's a story of responsibility. And you all know it, the picket fence painting. Well, I won't have, you know, there are enough murmurs, and those of you who don't know it should rush out and, <laughs> and read Tom, re -read Tom Sawyer. But we'll just say that, you see, responsibility there is held out as the greatest possible good for little kids, a much greater good than playing ball or playing hooky. Because responsibility is being human. Only humans are responsible, and gods. Animals are not responsible. Actually, pets we hold responsible. That's a whole other subject. <laughs> but, but you see how much is a description. Of course, they hold so then be clear. Of course, pets, especially dogs, are quite humanoid. They are, they are not really normal animals anymore. I mean, <laughs> they have become a part of the human society, and we hold them responsible. And also circus animals. Let's have a little break. Give my uh, voice a break, and then we'll talk. Then I'll go into. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much. Then, then we'll go into. Then, then we'll go into a, the, virtually the whole time into uh, suicide and the history of suicide. I'll have quite a few things to say about this, which you may not know. Thank you. T ten minutes. <laughs>